Korea, a, a leading world economy and a major player in both geopolitics and economics, but also of importance in general, that smaller open economies, essentially everyone but the US, China, and arguably the EU, is facing a world in which there is accelerating monetary tightening, global capital flows, or lack of global capital flows in some cases, and ongoing inflationary pressure. The monetary policy challenges in navigating those pressures are very real. Uh, they may demand a systemic response. There may not be one forthcoming. Uh, these are all the issues that monetary policymakers in today's world have to cope with. And I believe we are fortunate not just to hear from Governor Rhee today, but that Korea and the world economy is fortunate that Chang Yong is in the position he now is in. In my mind, um, Chang Yong is one of the great uh, economic public servants, both for Korea and globally of our generation. Um, he has been serving as the 26th governor of the Bank of Korea since this past April. Prior to his current position, where many of us got to work with him and know him very well, he joined the IMF and served as the director of the Asia and Pacific Department for almost eight years. Um, he oversaw the funds work in the region. He dealt with countries and multilateral surveillance ranging from China, Japan to the Pacific Islands. Um, you know, it's one of those classic Western-centric geographic things that Europe has a department at the IMF and it's this big, and Asia has a department at the IMF and it's this big, and Europe is this diverse and Asia is this diverse, and Chang Yong masterfully uh, contributed to global stability and prosperity from that role. Prior to that, um, he was chief economist of the Asian Development Bank, where I, my, our executive vice president, Marcus Noland, and a number of our colleagues had the privilege to work with him and his team on some research projects uh, at the ADB, joint with PIE. And even prior to that, he was secretary general and Sherpa uh, for the G10, G20, for the 2010, excuse me, G20 Seoul Summit. Uh, my predecessor, Fred Bergston, was deeply engaged with Chang Yong at that time and the leadership of Korea and Chang Yong served brilliantly in making that summit a success. Um, in addition to other prior roles, he's been a professor at Seoul National University where he graduated with honors, undergraduate, and he holds a PhD from Harvard University, which I'm in favor of. Um, yeah, Cheng Yong is well known to everybody, but of course, stepping into this role in Korea um, puts him in a very prominent role in that country. And of course, his foremost responsibility is to the well being and the stability of the Korean economy. But we're very fortunate that he can talk about both that and Korea's implications, not what Korea affect on the rest of the world, but the challenges that he and his neighbors face in this world economy. So, Governor Rhee, please. Thank you, Adam. And uh, I'm very greatly honored to be invited to PIIE and grateful for Adam again and my other friends here for providing me with this opportunity to talk about Korea's monetary policy and uh, amid an accelerated global monetary tightening cycle. And thanks for coming on Saturday. And I would also like to express my sincere congratulations to Dr. Wopstein on his retirement and my sincere gratitude for his excellent contributions and policy advice to the Korean government, especially uh, during the G20 summit in Korea in 2010. And unlike my previous visit to PIIE as a director of Asia Pacific Department at the IMF, this time, I feel it's more legitimate and uh, adequate to confine my talk to Korea specific issue rather than discussing Asia in general, but I'm happy to answer any questions at the end if you have. Uh, in fact, only three days ago, we decided to increase our policy rate by 50 BP to raise interest rate to 3%. Uh, this was the second 50 BP increase since July which where we actually increased 50, 50 BP uh, for the first time in our history. And uh, considering the high proportion of floating rate mortgage loans in Korea, 
over 60% compared with uh, less than 10% in the United States. Uh, you can think about our 50% increase of interest rate as having the equivalent impact of maybe 75 in BP increase uh, by the Fed. Before delving into the complex backdrop behind our decisions, let me briefly explain the BOK's uh, monetary policy decisions uh, since the first lift off last year after the COVID-19 uh, shock. So this chart uh, shows uh, you know, how we changed our interest rate and how the inflation uh, changes in Korea compared with the United States. We start to raise our base rate in August 2021, a bit earlier than other major central bank. And we, after that, we had a two other small increase. So the policy rate rose from 0.5% at the bottom to 1.25% by early 2022. Uh, as you know, lockdowns in Korea from COVID-19 uh, were relatively mild compared to compared with those in other economies, and which allowed us a smaller output loss and a relatively fast economy recovery. The, so the first hike, which happened relatively in a mild inflation around the mid-2000 level, uh, was actually done, it was intended to curb the rapidly expanding household debt and uh, uh, housing prices uh, with a very low interest rate environment. So basically our first increase in interest rate was intended to control the uh, you know, financial market stability, considering the household debt and the real estate prices rather than inflation itself. But in hindsight, uh, the earlier lift off uh, for this purpose was actually quite helpful when actually we start to deal with the rising inflation uh, the next year. As you know, oil prices uh, increased quite significantly after the uh, Russia-Ukraine war in February. This pushed inflation, our inflation to go up to 5% range, and uh, we had to uh, increase the uh, interest rate in April and May, where I start to serve as a governor, new governor, to ensure price stability, as did uh, many other central banks. In July, the, our CPI rose to 6% range, which is quite high compared with our historic averages. Uh, and the core inflation and the short-term inflation expectation is also approaching 4%. And then we definitely need to address this uh, you know, price stability more aggressively. And we decide to take a so-called big steps by Korean standard, which is 50 BP increase uh, for the first time in history. Uh, so after I joined the BOK, I, I have to say that it's not a fun time. You know, just uh, had to increase and follow the uh, trend in accelerating monetary tightening. And together with the big step, we also, for the first, probably first time, but we tried so-called sometime, so-called qualitative conditional forward guidance that uh, basically we say we will increase the policy rate uh, next time in a baby step by 25 BP increment for the foreseeable future, which means about the three to four months or so horizon. This communication is different from the uh, our past practice on BOK, which emphasized maintaining strategic ambiguity about the future path. And, and uh, 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 you know, the, but we actually try this uh, trend, I mean, practice a little bit for the uh, three reasons. Uh, first, we aim to ensure that financial market did not overreact to the unprecedented 50 BP hike, while we anticipate that the inflation would stabilize around 3% with the coming years, mainly uh, owing to the declining oil prices we, because we're expecting that the global growth will slow down. Second, we need to take stock of the impact of the past interest rate hike, totaling 125 BP over the past years on the economy. Third, uh, consecutive big steps uh, we think were not necessarily warranted given that our inflation rate was relatively low compared to the UK and the United States, and our labor market uh, was less tight 
compared with those of the United States. For example, this figure uh, shows the beverage curves in the United States and uh, in Korea. If you look at the uh, you know, change of beverage curves uh, in between Korea and US, the US curve, as you well discussed, appeared to shift upward, while uh, the beverage curve in Korea didn't change very much or looks shift down, you know, contrary to the US cases. I think this reflects the absence of uh, you know, substantial structural change in our Korean, Korean labor market because uh, we have the less restrictive COVID-19 lockdown measures. So with this different uh, in labor market, we expect that the upward pressure on wages should be smaller uh, in Korea than the United States. And uh, that we thought that we may not uh, need to really have a very aggressive monetary policy as in the United States. However, as you know, global financial market has seen severe turmoil since August, especially though September was quite bad, uh, which actually forced we to reconsider uh, our monetary policy path. Uh, Chairman Powell's speech in Jack Snow, which emphasized the record, uh, restoring price stability, had already been in some sense largely expected when we make a decision in July and August. However, uh, we have to admit that we did not expect that substantial upward revision of the dot plus, you know, when it's announced in September. Uh, we saw the federal, fund, you know, the federal fund rate at the end of 2022 as for the dot plus uh, is about 50 BP higher than we expected in when you make a decision in July and August. And uh, with this unexpected shocks, not only in Korea, but uh, the volatility of the global financial market has become significantly you know, increased. So in September, together with turmoil, Korean won depreciate rapidly in the face of the Fed accelerate tightening, in addition to the substantial de de depreciation of both Japanese and Chinese yuan. Uh, actually, my another headache is that two large central bank in the world, Bank of Japan and Bank of China, are exceptionally using the you know, expansion in monetary policy still, and their currency is depreciating, which give a more pressure to our currencies. And uh, global financial turmoil from the announcement of UK's unexpected expansion in fiscal policy didn't help either. And then uh, in this volatility, Korean won, which has been depreciating together with the dollar, but in September, our depreciation was faster than the you know, dollar index suggests. So that, uh, also there definitely there are also Korea specific reasons for the exchange rate change, including the deterioration of Korea's trade balance following the downturn in the semiconductor cycle. And the uh, Korean one was also used as a proxy currency for Chinese Yuan. So our volatility increased quite significantly. So to ease market volatility and by to stem herd behavior, we had to intervene in the FX market, FX market in some degree. Uh, so this rapid currency depreciation in September has made uh, our monetary policy decision more complicated and more challenging. As you know, many Koreans still have painful memories of the 1997 financial crisis and understandably are very sensitive to the increase in exchange rate. Uh, and uh, my job is to uh, secure and then to actively communicate, communicate uh, with the public that current financial turmoil and economic conditions are substantially different from the, those we experienced in 1997 or 2008. And then also I have to explain the current, current depreciation is a common phenomena across many countries, not just the Korea specific shocks. So in fact, I'm more confident and I'm less worried because unlike the uh, period in the, during the 1997 and 2008, uh, when we have a double mismatch problem, maturity and currency mismatch, and our reserve level was low, uh, currently Korea's net international, uh, okay, net international investment positions is about 41% of GDP, and uh, we have a 410 billion of, above 410 billion of US dollar FX reserves. 
and uh, our short-term debt ratio, liquidity conditions, all the sign is not that bad. You know, actually it's quite stable. Overall, I, in the last 10 years while I was in the United States, I didn't recognize, but uh, there are a lot of uh, foreign investment by Korean residents. So at this moment, if you look at the capital flow mobility in Korea, they are actually led by the Koreans rather than the, uh, the international investors. In that sense, we are the international creditor, and the exchange rate has a very mixed impact depending on your investment position. So I'm not worried about uh, you know, the bankruptcy, any balance sheet impact of FX depletion at this moment. It's more like a, you know, the, how the investment's ob objective is changing depending on the exchange rate. So, uh, and then also if you look at the, uh, oh, sorry. If you look at, uh, so uh, this effective exchange rate, uh, even though the, our nominal exchange rate depreciates by significantly, effective exchange rate is in very much close to the historic averages, which means we don't have any evidence of overvaluation, uh, unlike uh, in 1987 and 2008 period. And as a result, our CDS premium, all things are quite stable. So, uh, so I think at this moment, uh, the main reason why we focus on exchange rate is not the financial instability that we was worried before, but it's more like its impact on inflation rate. And then there may be we were a little bit worried about because the level of the exchange rate is very high compared to by historic average, whether there is any unforeseen corner that, for example, like hedge ratio or anything, something can actually trigger some unexpected events. So what I'm thinking about is like, a, you know, listen to UK pension, you know, saga is can be one of one example that some complex derivative, you know, structure may cause this high exchange rate itself may trigger more margin curves or some kind of unforeseen financial instability. So we are checking every day whether there is any any possibility. So far, uh, together with our regulators, I find that the situation is under control and we don't see it very much, partly thanks to the underdeveloped derivative market in Korea still. But I think uh, still we are very mindful whether we're going to have kind of you know, uh, difficulties at this moment. Anyway, with this background, before I come to the DC for annual meeting, I uh, just uh, raised, we, Monetary Policy Committee, raised uh, 50 BP, 50, uh, you know, interest rate again. And the second big step was mainly due to changes in the uh, preconditions of the Ford guidance we provide in July and August. Especially, uh, consumer price inflation is expected to remain uh, around 5 to 6% range, reflecting unexpected rise in exchange rate. And while the downside risk to the Korean economy together with the global economy has increased with weaker global growth prospect. And needless to say, uh, we are not targeting a specific level of the exchange rate, but we have to consider, as I mentioned, uh, how sharp rise in exchange rate would affect our financial stability condition. So uh, with that as a kind of background to why we decide to another uh, 50 BP increase in the second time. With regard to future policy direction, uh, unlike in uh, July, we made it clear that uh, we will prioritize price stability uh, to the utmost as long as inflation remain high in five and six percent range for the time being. However, we didn't suggest any specific size for the further increase of interest rate in November. This is because there are high, very high uncertainties including the what will how the Fed will decide in November. I think the the news that I just arrived, the new CPI numbers will really highlight what kind of uncertainties of the Fed in November, December decision is. And then also we have to look at the, how the oil price will change. And also the you know how the China's COVID policy, zero COVID policy will change after this party congress if there is any chance and uh, how the uh, Japan yen and uh, Chinese yuan volatility will behave. And these kinds of uncertainties will be very important 
our decision you know, uh, uh, down the road. So we can we emphasize this uncertainty instead of uh, suggesting you know what will be the size of the next step in our next uh, monetary policy committee meeting. So that is basically the background of how we change our monetary policy. And although it's only six months has passed since I took the office, one thing I can say without doubt is that the work of the central bank governor was much more challenging than I hoped for before. And uh, uh, there are still many things that I will learn probably down the road. Uh, I'd like to end my speech by conveying, uh, explaining two things that I've learned so far. The first, uh, I'm proud of my small contribution, if there is any, during my nine years of the work at the fund uh, in developing the integrated policy framework, which emphasized that uh, uh, in the, for the small open economies, instead of relying only on interest rate, uh, some combination of optimal policies, including FX intervention, capital flow measurement, and uh, measures, and macro prudential policies needed. And uh, I think, in fact, over the last couple of months, I have, what I've tried is to implement and operationalize this integrated policy framework. But now I have to confess that it's much harder than just writing a paper. And uh, uh, I will explain what kind of difficulties when I try to have you know, some optimal, uh, you know, of this measures intervention, interest rate, and uh, all other measures. It's very hard to communicate to the public. And uh, sometimes people say that I'm too timid in raising interest rate. And then the next day, some people say, why you intervene? And the next day, somebody say that you, shouldn't, you should intervene more to control the inflation. Uh, exchange rate. So it's kind of how whenever you try to have some mixture, always you have someone who criticize the other side. So I find, especially during the time of capital outflow, how to operationalize this integrated policy framework is much more challenging. But given my experience, I really hope to talk to Kita and the IMF colleagues again, how we kind of make the more specific models to operationalize integrated policy framework. That is one thing which I am very more interested in. Second, I have learned that the uh, Communication with the public is not easy when we transiting from the, our traditional strategic ambiguity approach to hinting some uh, forward guidance. Uh, you know, after we give a first forward guidance attempt, suggesting 25 BPs uh, down the road, in the beginning, we were praised because that kind of you know, approach stabilized domestic interest rate, but after, September, when in exchange rates start to depreciate, there's a huge criticism that this uh, forward guidance is the main reason for the exchange rate depreciation because we are suggesting 25 BP, people are expecting uh, more interest rate gap between the US that cause a depreciation and uh, you know, mood in the domestic market, criticize why you try this. So it's kind of hard to communicate. Surely we mentioned that this is conditional and then when we announced this policy in July and August, I mentioned that uh, we will review again after seeing the Fed decision in September. And in order to highlight that, I even mentioned that uh, uh, our Bank of Korea is now independent from the, uh, our government, but not from the Fed. That was intent to give this conditionality. But once these things happen, no one mentioned the conditionality because there are many critics believe that the forward guidance that we have given is a kind of commitment or promise. So when I change these things, a lot of complain. So I find that uh, I can understand uh, you know, why, but I find it's very difficult to change the old tradition. But on the other hand, I hope that uh, we can give you a little more transparent and we can give more information to the market. But given these difficulties, I think I have to probably consider you know, how fast I have to try to change the old tradition. So I realized that uh, you know, change is a very difficult thing in reality, but I hope that I can get uh, more advice from you. So, okay, so this summarizes uh, the ongoing uh, challenges that I'm facing, but uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. And I'm, uh, again, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to come back and uh, you know, have a chance to talk in the most uh, and most uh, the institution that I like most in the Washington DC, which is Peterson. Yeah, thanks so much.
Thank you, Governor Ree. Um, and thank you, of course, for your kind remarks about the Peterson Institute. Uh, as always in your previous roles, you combine a great deal of analytical substance with the real world challenges, and that's a feast for us. Let us start, though, going back to talking about Korea. Um, as you discussed the economy, um, two words which, as far as I could tell, didn't appear, or three words, two concepts, that didn't appear <coughs> in your discussion were energy and supply chain. Um, in the US and in the Europe, in the different weighting, those have been discussed massively as drivers of inflation. You didn't really talk about the components of inflation at all. Um, is this because it's just not relevant? Um, is this because Korea didn't suffer as much from energy and supply chain shocks? How does this fit in? So actually, I think uh, uh, main driver of the, our inflation is energy. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to really break down how a percentage it contributes, but direct import price increase of energy at this moment, energy and related, food related item, explain very easily more than 50% of our inflation increase. And then later on is more the, uh, the service price increase and uh, you know, goods price increase after we reduced the social distancing right. uh, after COVID. So definitely, I think you can think about it, we are in between US and Europe. So we are not as much affected by energy inflation as in, the United, in Europe, but we are more affected by the United States. So the textbook, and this again, you could argue this was part of the mistakes made in the US, but the textbook is that you can sort of let energy pass through. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that wage increases have not been that great yet in Korea. So why is it that you feel you need the aggressive, relatively aggressive uh, interest rate hikes if it is primarily an energy situation? So first uh, answer is that still, if you look at our core inflation, excluding food and energy, it's still around 4% plus, which is uh, historically high. So we need to do the containment. And second, because of that reason, our interest rate increase is much milder compared with the aggressive approach for some other countries. Uh, but recently, the main reason why we are taking 50 BP is more external sector conditions, you know, the impact of exchange rate depreciation, on our price stability and financial market stability. So that is a kind of very hard subject, you know. Yeah. So turning to the external factor, and I know you've thought about this in, at, in the Korean government previously, in the ADB, at the IMF, and you mentioned the integrated framework. There was a period where at least to external observers, it seemed like the Bank of Korea, the Korean Ministry of Finance and of the Economy were very much targeting the exchange rate. Mm -hmm. Um, you now seem to have moved away from that just at the time when the exchange rate is becoming the biggest issue it's been for a very long time. So could you say a bit more about why you think the integrated approach is right and how much of a shift this has been for Korea? First of all, I think the, the biggest lesson that we learned from 1997 is that we should not target the exchange rate itself. So I think that is well shared, not just me, but many poli uh, Korean policymakers. So uh, if you look at the, how much Korean won has depreciated in this period, actually we are the, among the top uh, you know, country which depreciate, let the exchange rate depreciate. I think I, we made the right decision. But why we need the integrated policy framework is that at this moment, the biggest problem is that market has a bet on one direction because uh, you know, oil price increase, the US continue to increase interest rate, and the many uh, other countries' currency will depreciate. So in the at least short term, unless the US ch change the policy trend, the bad thing is one side. So around this time, if the people see the depreciation, I don't know whether it has a positive impact to change the expectation down. So right. if you depreciate enough, whether you're gonna start to expect the appreciation. That is a theory, right? But given that the bad is on one side, we are worrying about that exchange expectation may be destabilizing. So especially when we find that our exchange rate is depreciating, 
more than dollar index because of the Chinese yuan and yen speculation, we had to uh, you know, intervene to stabilize the expectation. That has actually happened mostly aggressively in September. So what I can assure you is that we are not targeting the level, and we have been intervened very heavily before that, but something like a September event happens, inevitably we have to do it to stabilize expectation. How, that's very clear, um, just taking one step further, how effective do you feel that September intervention was? And, and since you seem to think it was reasonably effective, why do you think it was effective? Um, I think, first of all, we have a large reserve, so investors are very cautious not to bet, you know, you know unlike the past, so we have a, enough ammunition. Uh, second, I think uh, we tried not to reverse the trend. We just wanted to control the you know, speed. And uh, even after this turmoil, uh, when then another shock happens, the exchange rate actually slightly move upward too, you know, depreciate further slightly. So actually we are not trying to reverse the trend. So that, you know, in some sense with this amount of the ammunition, I think we can be very effective in controlling the speed, uh, you know, uh, speed rather than uh, you know, fighting for the trend. You're, you're notable in that you are not just diplomatic about other people's, pol other economies' policies, which all central bankers are, of course, but you, you seem to have a reasonable amount of sympathy for the situations of, as you mentioned, the Bank of Japan and the People's Bank yeah. of China, who are quite aggressively still easing all. Um, how much do you interact with your neighbors in terms of maybe not coordination, but worry about spillover effects or, or will they say of a, a, a yuan shock coming in the future? We, we do not have a explicit policy coordination in international policy coordination within Asia. So I think we are playing uh, our, our, we move our rate mostly focusing on our domestic situation. So I have, I, I have a good, I can understand very easily why, uh, you know, the Japan want to contain, uh, continue to have a loose monetary policy. And that has implication for the exchange rate. And I'm sure that uh, there is other political reason why they have to, you know, resist the too rapid, uh, you know, depreciation. Probably same reason that we are worrying about it. Uh, but at this moment, I think uh, we are mostly affected by the U.S. decision, China, Japan, and Korea. So rather than uh, the, probably if there is any international policy coordination, it should be U.S. and the large, large other advanced economies rather than within Asia. Well, so picking up on that, um, in the last week, um, Federal Reserve Vice Chair Brainerd mm -hmm. and Treasury Secretary Yellen, both on my reading, went... Um, one incremental step further in worrying a bit about spillover effects mm -hmm. than they had in the past. I mean, as we all know, usually Fed officials and Treasury officials from the U.S. say some version of, I feel your pain, but it's not my problem. Um, and Brainerd and Yellen, if I unfairly summarize them, went one step further and said, yeah, and it may even be having some effects on us too. Your problem may be having some effects on us too. But anyway, that's small compared to our domestic needs. So it wasn't that big a change. When when you say you know you have to react to the U.S., I mean, is there a case to be made that in the U.S. Fed and the U.S. own self-interest, they should be taking more account of what's going on abroad? I think Adam, at this moment, I think. Uh... It's not just the dollar strength which caused this problem. I think the unique thing at this moment is that the combination of the oil price increased together with the dollar strength. When I look at the history, when the U.S. dollar was very strong, usually there's more cases that the oil price is lower. Right. But this time is very exceptional in the sense that the high oil price come together with a, a strong dollar. So that has a very different implication uh, for the emerging markets, depending on whether you are a commodity exporters or commodity importers. So if you look at the current situation in Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, you can see, because they are commodity exporters, their situation is much more 
you know, better than the other right. in market. So we have to really think about, uh, you know, this issue together. So I'm sure that as long as the energy price remain high, as long as uncertainties in Ukraine war continues, uh, I think U.S. may have to focus more on the inflation first. So this is actually dynamics interforce each other. And uh, given high inflation rate, we can fully understand why U.S. maintain aggressive uh, you know, interest rate policy. But as you mentioned, the good news is that in during this annual meeting, uh, you know, Chairman Powell and, uh, you know, Lyle and many others start to talk about the spillovers. So I think, you know, when time comes, I think U.S. will probably address the global dollar liquidity. So we'll see how it goes. Um, just building on that, the looking at your exchange rate chart um, or other ones that are going on out there, this is the biggest dollar appreciation in, in breadth mm -hmm. since 98 and arguably in persistence since 85. Mm -hmm. um, in the mid 80s, we did have the famous or infamous Plaza Accord, Rubro mm -hmm. Accord. Is that something that has any relevance for today? That's a big topic. And uh, to me, uh, I think uh, definitely too strong dollar, especially for sustainable period, won't be good for the United States either. You know, actually, I'm thinking about it's a long-term implication for the trade deficit, and uh, maybe another global imbalance may happen. So I think, but for the time being, but I think, uh, uh, you know, but I agree that first job is to make the turnaround of the high inflation rate. But I think uh, probably U.S. and uh, many advanced economies have to think about what does it mean for the medium term issue. So some kind, I wouldn't say the project code. At that time, project code, there is a domestic uh, driver in the United States side to push this agenda. But I, I don't see it now in the United States because, you know, uh, it's more focused on the fighting inflation. And actually the demand for that kind of agreements come from the other side. Right. So how this politic dynamics will happen, we have to see it. But I think uh, after the certain period, some degree of international cooperation may be needed. Um, keeping you on the international front before we return specifically to Korea, um, you are well aware and you made reference to it very briefly in your speech. Um, the issue is not so much for G20 economies like you, Korea or Indonesia or Brazil, but for the low and middle income economy. Mm -hmm. Um, caught between the strong dollar and high commodity prices, high energy prices. Um, your old friend Larry Summers came out and um, made a statement in the last couple of days about how disappointed he is in the IMF World Bank G20 for not stepping up to address this issue. Not to ask you to disclose what happened in the meetings you were in, but what do you think is feasible? What do you think is desirable for the international community to do for the lower income economy? I think that uh, given the situation, I think what uh, MD, uh, IMF and MDB is trying to do, maybe it's not enough, but had some progress. For example, like IMF recently introduced RST, it's a medium term, long term instrument, and then also the uh, funding for the address the food crisis issue. So uh, maybe not enough, but I think uh, that kind of help uh, is very essential for the low income countries. But more important thing is a coordination of the debt restructuring coordination, because you know, just give a new money may not be enough to resolve issue. In that sense, I think the international uh, uh, you know, community, more than Paris Club, and the many new creditors in the world has to cooperate and uh, has to reach a rapid debt restructuring agreement. That will be crucial uh, to address this issue. Thank you. Um, you. You, as we've mentioned, you've been a Sherpa, you've been a department head at the IMF. So I'm, I'm gonna ask you to venture a slight bit more broadly, which is the growing US-China tensions or conflict at this point, I think we can call it, um, 
are having effects on the economies of the world, on Korea in particular. Um, China is Korea's most important trading partner. U.S. is, of course, Korea's, I think, second or third largest trading partner and its security guarantor. Um, I realize you're not the foreign minister, but what would you hope for in this sphere? I mean, is, are there things that, let's call them third countries like Korea, countries that are neither China nor the U.S. can do in this situation? Actually, you know, the in this annual meeting, Gita had, a, in my opinion, great presentation, early warning exercise, and she addressed the issue of fragmentation which basically shows the economic cost of the geopolitics tension and including the uh, you know, China-US tensions. And there's one chart which shows that after this geopolitical tension in 1920s, for the next 20 years, world trade volume, trade of GDP ratio declined quite significantly. And I think currently that is a real challenge and real threat for the global economy, especially for uh, many Asian countries, including Japan and China. Because basically, I, we, in the last 20 years, China is engine of the growth for the world, but especially for Asia. We know that China's economy will slow down, but with the larger size, we expect that China will play a, continue to play an important role as an engine of growth, especially they are moving from factory of Asia to the consumer of Asia with, with the rising middle income country. But now with this geopolitical, geopolitical tension, I think the debt market may not be available for the Asia in general. So we have to, this is a real cost. And uh, we really hope that it won't happen, but politics at this moment doesn't seem to be that optimistic. And uh, I, I really hope that uh, China can play a very important role, especially at this moment, I think a solution of the whole global problem has to start from the stopping of the russia ukraine war. And uh, I believe if there's any country or any leader who can talk to Putin, I think it's China. And if China can deliver these things soon as a you know, global leader, that can destroy the confidence and there can be a bridge between the Russia and the West. And then that will, as a byproduct, will enhance the confidence between US and China. And that can resolve many issues. So I really hope that uh, you know, my, our friends in China can step up effort to uh, uh, stop the Russia war, and then talk to U.S. and then so that to reduce the risk of this fragmentation. Thank you. Um, I want to give everyone a pause for a second to let that sink in and to make sure that the PIE video clippers clip that a bit. Um, let me take you back though to the more day-to-day -day part of your job. Um, you made some very interesting comments in your speech, Governor, about introducing a measure of forward guidance to the um, to the policy framework of the of the Bank of Korea. Um, from the outside, as a monetary economist, you know it, it sounds to me relatively minor in the sense that you're increasing transparency. Um, and a lot of central banks have done that over the last 20 years. Could you say a bit more about why you feel the amount of forward guidance you and the bank have been giving is controversial and any preliminary evidence you have that this is working better for the bank than strategic ambiguity would have? I think it's controversial. I have to admit that uh, you know, the opinion can vary. But why I tried is I hope that uh, if strategic ambiguity is our choice, I'd be okay. If we have all technical ability and uh, we have uh, experience, but if we decide that uh, uh, you know, the strategic ambiguity is better, I can accept it. But at this moment, why I'm trying to change a little bit is actually to, I find that the Bank of Korea need a little bit more, uh, you know, experience and the technical capacity to do so. Because we are not uh, announcing any dot plus or anything, even though we are not doing the 
uh, quarterly forecast. We are doing more like a, a semi-annual forecast. So I think with this uh, practice of talking about the future a little bit more than before, we, uh, we want to improve our technology, technical capacity, and then we want to move small, uh, you know, a little bit further to to have a more uh, to provide more information. So in general, I, I wouldn't call this is forward guidance. What I'm right. trying to do is I want to convey the information how our monetary policy committee members discussed and the thinking right. about this issue. That will give uh, information to the market so that in between the time between our monetary policy meetings, if there is something unexpected happen, Mark can adjust from the baseline that we, pro, you know, what monetary policy committee meeting members are thinking. So that I think is a kind of right amount uh, of change that we can afford to. But I find that uh, uh, the market and the people are not so accustomed to it. So, uh, so it still causes a lot of controversy. Well, I just, if you'll permit me, as somebody who's worked on these issues, I, th I think actually you're, you're, you're doing yourself a slight disservice by labeling it forward guidance. I think what yeah. you just described is absolutely right. You are increasing transparency, you're showing more of what the thinking is and the contingent scenarios. Mm -hmm. I think that's helpful. And I would also just encourage you to think about, just as you did with the integrated framework work you did at the fund, you don't have to go all the way to what the U.S. did. And no, I think no. there's a lot of reasons why the Fed regrets some of the dot plot stuff right now. Um, so, sorry, too much editorializing by me, but anyway. Um, so continuing on the outlook for the rate hike. Medium term, mm -hmm. longer term. Um, assuming, God willing, we get through this mess. Mm -hmm. Where do you see... Korean potential growth. I mean, there are obviously very large demographic trends at work. Um, as you mentioned, the if we stay on this political path, the trade opportunities in the world may be shrinking. Um, does the bank have a view on potential growth going forward? If you just use the econometric model and just plug into the, our population uh, uh, trend, uh, most academic estimate point out that our potential growth in next 10 years will be around 1%, even lower. But I really hope that that is not preordained. In my opinion, I see some prospect that we can increase uh, productivity. And we, uh, I'm trying, I'll be happy to see that around 2% potential growth rate despite this population trend. And the way we have to do it is. Uh, diversify our economy. And when I actually look at our youngsters, I'm very you know, uh, optimistic because compare, I mean, I should not compare with other countries, but our youngsters are now have a lot of uh, challenging mind. If you know that uh, now K-pop and yeah. Korean drama, and if you look at the many IT businesses, I see uh, many new small companies are doing it. Previously, uh, our bank dominated uh, financial structure didn't help it very much because you know it, it, there's their nature discovers and didn't finance those kind of new challenges. But with the uh, new IT and the new uh, uh, you know DeFi, whatever you know, new financing structure, we see that uh, they are get a lot of financing from abroad too. With the success of K-pop and K-drama, now there are more foreigners actually to willing to provide the financing to our young young entrepreneurs. So I, I see that as a hope, and uh, I hope that despite the population trend, we can manage around 2% potential growth rate. Mm -hmm. um, great to have that positive, uplifting note, and, and let me just follow on that. I guess it was not quite 10 years ago, eight so years ago, you and I uh, were together in Seoul with the then IMF MD Lagarde, mm -hmm. Um, for a conference that we, your department of PIE put on. And Madame Lagarde went to the Women's University and mm -hmm. held a big talk. As, as our colleagues, um, Jacob Kierkegaard, Karen Dynan, and Anna Stansbury have written about, you know, female labor force participation in Korea remains quite low, and there's mm -hmm. very 
obvious divides and gaps in the treatment of women versus men in the workforce. Um, of the many things Japan has and hasn't done, womenomics under late Prime Minister Abe seems to have made a difference. What are the prospects in this context of potential growth for mobilizing the talent and the, the labor supply that <laughs> women represent? Actually, I like that paper very much. That paper was very influential and uh, right at the point. And when I say that, right, I expecting 2% growth rate, I talk about productivity, but that includes the new source of the labor supply from female. And then also we have to open for the foreign you know, workers more, okay? so not to repeat the yeah. mistake in other countries. Uh, I see the trend. I see more female participation, especially the young women. And the problem is that they want to work longer and then so, Fertility, you know, the yeah. fertility is going down. But I think we have to uh, provide uh, more culture that help female workers to work together with having a baby. That is actually the direction we have to go. So at this moment, when I look at the, my daughters and their friends, they're willing to keep the job and they think that, that they have to sacrifice family. And uh, this is a very important challenge. We have to. Uh, provide the support and uh, you know make sure that uh, they can have both job and family, and that that will actually will be a that will be a great contribution to our potential growth rate. Wonderful. Um, for my last question, and then we should let you get back to your important work this Saturday. Um, so, looking again at at the medium term. Um, as you mentioned, the Bank of Korea is independent. Um, Korea has had a lively democracy with very meaningful shifts in policy uh, between governments. Um, how do you see the Bank of Korea's role in 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 Korean policymaking in Korean society? When when I mean, thank God you do not have the divisions and dysfunctions that the U.S. does right now. But where you do have very partisan politics, mm -hmm. how do you manage that at the Bank of Korea? I think Bank of Korea has a history. And uh, until 1997, Bank of Korea was not independent from the government. And it was, uh, probably I shouldn't use this word, but mostly kind of controlled by the government. But after the long, uh, or the effort uh, from 1997, our independence has been earned and uh, respected. So at this moment, I think the role of Bank of Korea is uh, many people uh, think that Bank of Korea is more politics free, free, and then uh, ask for uh, more uh, professional advice. But somehow, I think that I can say that within within the Bank of Korea, before I joined the bank. I think there is some uh, thinking among the Bank of Korea staff that we we have been too cautious in advising uh, you know, government because we, we own the independence so much. So engaging with the government may actually reverse the trend. So there is a self-control uh, not to engage with the government. But one thing I'm trying to do, actually two things I'm trying to do at this moment is, I think we own the independence with a lot of effort. But now we have to own respect. So we want to not only the monetary policy, but I want to Bank of Korea to become a most, you know, you know, most respected think tank. So we can have uh, advice for other policies so that the government can use. That's one direction we want to go. And then the other thing is from my side is that since we know what other worlds are doing too, so we can provide uh, policy advice which are proven internationally so that we minimize our policy mistake. So these are two things that uh, currently I and uh, our bank of staff is trying to deliver. Terrific. Thank you all for joining us today here in Washington. And thanks especially to Dr. Cheng Young ri governor of the Bank of Korea, Thank you. who honored us with a discussion of uh, the challenges of making monetary policy amidst an accelerated global monetary tightening. This meeting is adjourned.